Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbat to see shalom. everyone. Good to be with you. I have been following all week the many apologies the Pope has been offering across Canada. And I'm interested in how a religious person offers an apology, uh, different than the apologies offered by prime ministers of this country. The religious language and, and undertones and overtones are interesting to me. And this morning, uh, we looked at, during our Torah study, we looked at Maimonides' four steps to teshuva. And we asked, how does the Pope's apology or collection of apologies measure up? So you can be the judge. Maimonides of the 12th century says the first step to true uh, repair and repentance is to verbally confess the sin, to name it, and to ask for forgiveness. So many in the group said the Pope did not name it in its entirety. All the crimes against indigenous peoples of this land. The second step Maimonides suggests is to express sincere remorse, resolving never to make, uh, to repeat that sin again. And most people around the table this morning said yes, they could see in this pope uh, sincere remorse. And perhaps he may have even said more if only he could have. The third step Maimonides requires of us is to do everything in our power to right the wrong in order to appease the one who has been hurt. And there seemed to be consensus there among everyone at the study table this morning that neither the Catholic Church nor this good country has done everything in its power to right the wrongs. And fourthly, Maimonides says, we must, in order, and this is often forgotten, those first three steps may seem obvious in the process of teshuva, but the fourth step is often forgotten. But Maimonides says it is essential. It's really the only way you know that your repair is complete, that your teshuva has been fulfilled. And that is that if the same situation should ever arise again, you will act differently, altogether differently. And so we have to ask ourselves, is the situation arising again? Of course, in different ways now. But indigenous Canadians are still oppressed in countless ways. And so we have not fulfilled Maimonides' requirement to act differently if the situation should ever arise again. Like you, I was also taken by the protest of the Cree woman, C.P. Ko, um, also known as Trina Francois, in her traditional garb, in her traditional language, protesting before the Pope and also before the chiefs who were standing behind him. She explained afterwards that she was upset that the chiefs were standing behind him and not behind her. So we see an internal uh, struggle among indigenous Canadians at play as well. I went back to the Pope's address, his apology, his first apology in April when indigenous leaders traveled to the Vatican, uh, really going, I would say, above and beyond uh, what would be expected of them, for them to go to his house um, in order to receive the apology. And there he said in part, your experiences have made me ponder anew those ever timely questions that the creator addresses to humankind in the first pages of the Bible. After the first sin, God asks, where are you? 
Ayaka in Hebrew. Then, a few pages later, God asks another question, inseparable from the first. E Hevel Achicha, where is your brother Abel? Where are you? Where is your brother? The Pope teaches us. These are questions we should never stop asking. They are the essential questions raised by our conscience, lest we ever forget that we are here on this earth as guardians of the sacredness of life, and thus guardians of our brothers and sisters and of all brother peoples. This theme of brothers and sisters, brothers specifically, repeats itself again and again and again in the Tanakh, in the Hebrew Bible. It is a running motif, and once it's pointed out to you, you'll see it everywhere. It's undeniable. So what I'd like to do with you now in this informal summer setting is to have a look at how this theme of brotherhood plays out in our Parsha, and then see how all the language and categories were already set up for us at the very beginning in the verses that the Pope pointed to uh, way back in Genesis. And you'll see how these two texts, from way over there to way over here, are actually a pair. They are twin texts speaking to one another. So let me invite you first um, to open up your Plout Torah commentary once again, page 1105. And we're going to look at some of the verses that Rabbi Kay referenced in his introduction to the Torah reading. This is the scene where the Reubenites and the Gadites and also the half-tribe of Menashe um, decide that it looks pretty nice on the east side of the Jordan River. So we're on page 1105 at the bottom of the page. The Reubenites and the Gadites owned cattle in very great numbers noting that the lands of Jezer and Gilead were a region suitable for cattle. The Gadite and Reubenite leaders came to Moses and said, let's see, um, let's look at verse 4, the land of the eternal, the land that the eternal has conquered for the community of Israel is cattle country, and your servants have cattle. It would be a favor to us, they continued, if this land were given to your servants as a holding. Do not move us across the Jordan. So this is a plan, very practical, looking at the needs and the match of the land with the people and their skill set and their aspirations. And yet, it is an affront. This is an offense, not only to Moses and the Israelites, but to God, God's self. So let's look at verse 6, Moses' reply. Would someone like to read for us in the English, Moses replied, just to hear another voice? Let's see. Terrific. Aaron, a, a new student of Torah. Terrific. Uh, so verse 6, loud voice. Okay. Moses replied to the Gadites and the Reubenites, Are your brothers to go to war while you stay here? Why will you turn to the minds of the Israelites from crossing into the land, into the land that the Eternal has given them? That is what your fathers did when I sent them from the Kardesh Barnea. Okay, thank you. 
so you can, Moses is repeating God's fury. And if we jump to verse 16 on the next page, uh, they stepped up again to Moses and they say, okay, so we'll build our sheepfolds and our flocks and our towns for our children here on the east of the Jordan River. And we will then hasten as shock troops in the van of the Israelites until we have established them in their home while our children stay in the fortified towns because of the inhabitants of the land. We will not return to our homes until the Israelites, every one of them, are in possession of their portion. But we will not have a share in them in the territory beyond the Jordan, for we have received our share on the east side of the Jordan. Okay, so they got the message. So we will be loyal to our brothers and our sisters. We will cross over the Jordan River. We will fight alongside, shoulder to shoulder. And only once the Israelites are settled safely in the land, we will return to our families on the east of the Jordan River. Okay, so this is a story of uh, brotherhood and loyalty. And let's look at what lays the groundwork for this scene, that early twin text, which I promised you. If you turn now all the way back uh, in the Chumash to page 27. We're going to go back to the beginning. And I hope you'll see all these um, little ties from one text to the other and see how the two texts speak to one another and sort of reverberate off of one another. This is a story, another terrifying story about brothers, uh, which you know quite well. Um, let's begin with verse 2. She, meaning Chava, Eve, then continued giving birth to his brother Abel. Abel became a shepherd while Cain tilled the soil. So these are the first brothers, according to the Bible. These are the first siblings. These are uh, the first children. And the second generation of humanity, according to Genesis. So this is really bedrock. What we're about to read now tells us something about how it was established at the very beginning, before civilization grew, before there were multiple peoples with multiple languages. This was when everything was new and, um, and, and rugged. One day in the course of time, Cain brought some of his harvest as an offering to the eternal. And Abel, too, brought an offering from among the choice lambs of his flock and their fattest parts. The Eternal approved Abel and his offering, but did not approve Cain and his offering. Cain was filled with rage, and his face fell. So there is, as there was with the Gadites and the Reubenites, there is a kind of border being drawn between brothers here. There is a divide between the two. Uh, verse 5, but uh, ba, ba, ba. Cain was filled with rage and his face fell. The eternal one then said to Cain, why are you so angry? Why has your face fallen? Would you not do well to lift it? For if you do not do well, sin is a demon at the door. You are the one who craves it and yet you can govern it. So what is introduced here at the very beginning, God says, there is sin. There is crime against humanity. There is transgression. There is wrongdoing. That is part of the human condition. Beware of it. Be on the lookout for it. It's part of how I made you. It's part of the, the dust of the earth, the lowly stuff of your form. Verse 8, Cain now thought about his brother Abel. Then, when they were in the field, Cain turned on his brother Abel and killed him. This is the first murder. This is the first killing. This is the first death. Some come to... Cain's defense and say he couldn't have known. 
But others say he did know. Then the Eternal One said to Cain, A Havel Achicha, where is your brother Abel? And this is what the Pope quoted in his first apology. Where is your brother? This is the question we need to ask ourselves. This is the question that the Torah demands we ask in every generation, in every chapter. We see it over and over again. Think of Joseph and his brothers. Think of Jacob and Esau. Think of David and his brothers. Over and over again, where is your brother? And he replied, how should I know? Hashomer achi anochi, am I my brother's keeper? And God says, what have you done? Your brother's blood is shrieking, crying out to me from the ground. And here, I hope you can hear the resonances of the war on the west side of the Jordan River, right? Your brother's blood is crying out to me, the blood of war the blood that is being spilled. Now you are cursed by this very soil which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hands. When you till the soil, no longer shall it give you its yield. Think of those, uh, what did Rabbi Kay call them? The cowboys. Think of those cowboys who said, this land is just fine for us over here. God is saying to Cain, the soil that you depend upon, that you work for, will no longer give you its yield. You shall become a rootless wanderer on the earth. If the Reubenites and the Gadites and the half-tribe of Manasseh had not been set straight by Moses and God and gone to the other side of the river to fight, they would have also been rootless wanderers out there in exile, outside of the promised land. Cain then said to the Eternal One, my punishment is too heavy to bear. Seeing as now you have expelled me from the face of the soil and I must hide from your face, I am become a rootless wanderer on the earth and anyone who finds me might kill me. So there is shame. And the Pope spoke many times, he used the word shame and indignation. From the very beginning, that is our experience. And if you let your eyes fall um, to verse 15, this is where we'll conclude. Not so, said the Eternal One. Should anyone kill Cain, he would be avenged sevenfold. And the Eternal gave Cain a sign that none who came upon him would kill him. Cain then went away from before the Eternal and settled in the land of nomads. And where was he? East of Eden like east of the Jordan River. So Cain's vulnerability and the vulnerability of the Roomba Knights and the Gadites parallel. Cain's um, sin and the near sin, or we could call it a sin of the Roomba Knights and the Gadites, weighed them both down. They both learned the hard way, the lesson of brotherhood and sisterhood. And I believe this is, what, this is why the Pope lifted up these verses in his first apology, that this is the lesson to all of us. We could read this week's Torah portion specifically about uh, the, the particularity of Jewish brotherhood, what it means to be among the tribes of Israel. And yes, that is a unique relationship. That is a unique kind of loyalty. But when we see that this week's parsha is rooted in Genesis, at the very beginning, with the first two brothers to ever live, then we see a universal message, that every human being is a brother and a sister. And that is what the Cree woman stood for. She said, when she was interviewed afterwards, she said that in her mind as she sang, in her mind were the indigenous women, men, and children who would never come home. 
and she also recalled her own brother who had been sent to residential school. So for her, it was also the, la the language of tribe and unique peoplehood, a particularity. But when the Pope was addressing all of us, not just Catholics, he was urging us to see that every human being is a sibling and we are accountable to one another. So after a hard week, um, let us recommit to turning once again to the 96 calls to action. If you go to the government website, uh, you'll find that it is very easily accessible and organized in a way that can help us to be part of the solution and to do what Maimonides urges us to do, to right the wrongs and to act differently when the situation arises once again. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you.